Good afternoon, Facebook family and friends, YouTube followers, however you may be finding our video today. We welcome you to a, a midweek moment. Pastor Craig Ponder coming to you from New Salem Baptist Church, hoping and praying that you've enjoyed uh, these snow days. Well, speaking only those East Tennessee, Washington County, at least yesterday was a well-deserved snow day. Monday, eh, not at all. Today, you know, a little, little sketchy. But hey, if I had kids at home, I know they'd be enjoying that. So we're making the most of it. Hope you are as well. Beautiful day out today, but above all else, it's the glorious to know that our Heavenly Father shines His love down on us and shows down in many ways. And some ways we have asked for. Oftentimes His showing of His love is in response to our prayers, but sometimes He blesses us with ways that uh, we hadn't even anticipated. And for that, we give Him all glory and all praise today. We want to pray together, uh, asking the Lord's blessings on many of you. I know we continue to pray for several within our church family. Miss Tanya Ward still uh, recuperating from her uh, surgery. We continue to ask God's blessings on her, um, and I know continually praying for several. Uh, we won't mention all those names because a lot of you don't know them, a lot of you that are watching, uh, but our, our, our list here at our church grows every week, and we've got some folks that are they're bearing up in the worries and cares and burdens, and I know many of you are as well. So let's go to the Lord and ask him to, to be all that his people need him to be. How about that? Father God, I praise you, Father, for the privilege to be able to come today, Lord, and just sort of step into the week, Lord, in a, in a lunchtime moment for those folks, Lord, that could maybe use a little distraction, a little, little something to break the routine of the day, uh, maybe slip away from the office or from work and, find their phone in a corner somewhere, however they may find us. There may be some, Lord, that have stumbled across this, this little video, Father, that uh, don't even know what to expect. And I just ask you, Lord, that you'd use me. Bless our time together, Lord. Season it with your spirit, Father, that it would be a word of encouragement and a blessing, Lord, to those that are desperate for it. Father, you know our heart today. Father, you know those places in our own lives, Lord, the worries and cares on, on this old pastor's heart of mine. I, I pray, Father, that you will lift those worries for me. Help me, Lord, to know how to roll them over and to trust you more every day. I'd ask forgiveness of my sin. Cleanse my heart and my mind, Father, those things that would hinder me from being used. I just want to be a vessel that you can speak through today. And however you choose to use this, Lord, I'll be so grateful. Thank you for it. But, Lord, we think of many today, Lord, that are uh, sick in body. I pray a continued blessing on, on Miss Tanya, Lord, as she's uh, recuperating at home. I think of Floyd Claypole, Lord, and he's still recovering. Miss Sandy James went to get eye surgery today. So, Father, I pray your blessing upon those, Lord, that, that are on my heart, Lord, as I've said before, even when I when I stop to pray, Lord, there's these this names and faces that kind of cross through our mind's eye. I pray, God, you lift those worries and cares. Miss Mary Davidson, I pray a special prayer, Lord, for her today, that you'll strengthen her and all the families they, as they tend to her needs. But Father, I pray for those unspoken needs. Lord, I know there's mamas and daddies and mamas and papas, Lord, that are, that are carrying great burdens. I know there are children and young people, Father, that have worries and anxieties in their life. And I pray, God, that you'll show yourself to be faithful for those folks that need it the most. I pray for our president. I pray for his heart. I ask you, Father, that you'll continue, Lord, to, uh, to, to work on his heart, Father, and open his heart to receive the truth of your word. And Father, the decisions he made for the betterment of this country pray, God, that you will bless us, Father, uh, and, and bless this country, Father, in every way. So use this time together. Lord, bless us as we speak your word. Let it be a word of encouragement for those that are needing it. In Jesus' name I do pray. Amen and amen. Amen. If you're on Facebook, you might have saw that one I posted yesterday in the little sun the snow. It said, this is the day the Lord has made. I'll be glad and rejoice in it. Some days are easier. There's still the days that the Lord has made. And that, that brought back to my mind this morning this song. And I hope it'll bless your heart. Every morning when I wake to see the sun, I can't help but think about the Lord and all the things He's done. He meets my every need. You know He's been so good to me. And I can't Praise the Lord for all He's done, for all He's done. I'm going to lift my hands to praise. 
praise Him for all He's done. I'm going to live my life to please Him, even though I don't deserve to live. My life has just begun, and I can't help but praise the Lord for all He's done. There are many things that I could praise God for. And if I started now until I died, there'd still be many more. If I could mention only one, I'd have to thank Him for His Son. That's enough to praise the Lord for all He's done. For all He's done. I'm gonna lift my hands to praise Him for all He's done. I'm gonna live my life to please Him, even though I don't deserve to live. My life has just begun, and I can't help but praise the Lord for all He's done. Even though I don't deserve to live. My life has just begun, and I can't help but praise the Lord. I can't help but praise the Lord. Oh, I can't help but praise the Lord for all He's done. Praise the Lord for all he's done. By a show of hands, how many testify to that? I can't see your hands, but I know God's been good to you. I think if you recognize it and look for it in your life, you'll see it very quickly and very vividly. Amen. Let me ask you this just by way of, of, a, of a kickoff uh, this day together. Could we not all agree, I think I can say this with complete confidence, that, that trying to live a Christian life in the day in which we find ourselves today is, is fraught with anxiety and, and can sometimes be frustrating and a little intimidating. We have become the minority. Bible-believing, evangelical Christ followers have quickly become the minority in this country of ours. And there's a, a much help to be found in, in the pages of God's Word and without even, out of the blue, I'll say, I was, I was concentrating and focusing and trying to hear God's word on, on what to do for these Wednesday uh, midweek moments, maybe a, a stretch of a few of them together or just, just for today. And with, with just that quick and with that much clarity, the Lord dropped into my mind the little epistle of James. I hadn't even thought about James in the longest time, but in response to my prayer, that's where he took me. Let me tell you, let me tell you where, um, why I love the little book of James. James is, is the original, um, and, and I say this very hesitantly, no, no insult implied or intended, it's the original Christianity for Dummies book. Here's why, here's why I say that. I've got these books on my shelf. I want to show you these. I've got this one that says Christian Prayer for Dummies. And that same collection is, is, is Christianity for Dummies, right alongside the Bible for Dummies. Now, don't let those titles trip you up. It's not as tongue-in-cheek as you sound, particularly this one, Christianity for Dummies. This was not the very first one ever written, uh, but uh, this, this little book written by by Richard Wagner, got a great um, uh, uh, what are you trying to, a forward in front of it from Kurt Warner. You remember NFL football Christian quarterback Kurt Warner? He wrote he writes a great um, forward in it. But this thing surprised me. It, it's full of, of uh, timelines and, and outlines of how the Bible came to be. It deals with with topics like the Trinity and, and the sacraments and heaven. I mean, it's it's not at all. It's not a bad little desk reference, even though the title is a little misleading, Christianity for Dummies. 
But the original Christianity for dummies I propose to you today is the book of James. It was written between 45 and 50 A.D., just 45 years or so after Jesus had gone back to heaven. Um, all of the, the evidence points to the fact that, that James, the brother of Jesus, the half-brother of Jesus, was probably the author. He had become the recognized leader of the church in Jerusalem. And in his little book, uh, he, he outlines some very practical aspects of Christian living, what living this Christian life ought to look like. There are some concrete, ethical instructions on how this Christian life ought to look, what it ought to look like, and how it ought to operate in everyday life. And I'm, gonna, I'm just going to, over the next, oh, I don't know, I don't know how long we'll spend here. I wish I could tell you I've got it outlined, but, but I, I just want to read little snippets of it for you every day, make a few passing comments on it, and challenge you to go back and read it yourself. You ought to go back and, and just spend some time. Um, it's five chapters long, and and every every piece of it is, is just chock full of, of helpful stuff. But I, I want to read to you the first five verses. Uh, James chapter 1, I'm reading from the New American Standard again today, says this, James, a bondservant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes who were dispersed abroad, greetings. <coughs> Excuse me. Consider it all joy, my brethren, when you encounter various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance, and let endurance have its perfect results, so that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. But if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all generously and without reproach, and it will be given to him. James calls himself a bond servant of God. He recognizes that he's been blood-bought by the shed blood of Jesus Christ. And, and like any slave that's been bought off of the slave market, he quickly recognizes that he has no opinion, he has no law, his master's words are his, he has no rights, no personal goals in and of himself. All of his needs are being provided closely because of his master's which is slow, solely based upon what Christ would want for his life. What a great place for us to arrive in our walk with the Lord. Amen. What a great place for us to get to. It puts us kind of into groupings of people like Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and Moses and Joshua and the prophets and Paul and Jude coming to the place where I recognize what my life, where my life and what my life looks like because of my relationship with my Heavenly Father. But he does say there, though, that in this Christian life, various trials, King James Version says diverse temptations that can be viewed um, as difficulty with a purpose. Hmm? Trials and, and diverse temptations, difficulties in this life that have a purpose. And that purpose in this particular case is to purify us and make us more like Jesus. Now wherever you find yourself today, I am sorry for my nose itching and I'm trying to scratch it discreetly. But you can't hardly scratch it discreetly when you're when you're looking at people over a camera. Trials and temptations uh, are the, are times for us as believers to to sort of test our wings like a little baby bird learning how to fly. The times of testing uh, are meant to to bring us to a new place, help us to arrive at a new place. The the word used for trials there in those first five verses. Is the same word that talks about purifying a, a metal, you know, like gold or silver, purifying it uh, for the purposes of making coins, perhaps. James is proposing that we need trials in our life. That's a hard pill to swallow. I mean, and for him to recognize that we need these trials in our life because they produce the maturity uh, in our lives, producing us, um, making us grow closer in our Christ likeness. So I think we'll spend a couple of minutes today, uh, maybe as we begin this little little walk through the book of James, let James tell us how we're supposed to respond to trials. Let me let me quickly point these out to you and I'll let you get back to the rest of your day. Notice in verse number two, he says that we are to count them all joy. Count them joy. Now let me let me let me quickly make this observation. Uh, we need to make this, the assumption, the same assumption that James makes based on what Paul's written, based on what Jesus has told us. The assumption here is that trials 
hard times, struggling days, they're a matter of when, not if. James' assertion here is clearly, like Paul, like Jesus, you're going to experience trials. The New Testament is crystal clear on this point. If you're a Christian, if you're striving to be a Christ follower, you're going to have trials. You're going to have tribulations. You're going to suffer from time to time. And the look and the shape of those, as James says, various. The Greek word for the word there, or even the divers temptations, as King James says, the Greek word there actually means many colored. James says that the trials of our life are kind of like Skittles, a rainbow of fruit colors. My trials are not going to be your trials. The things that I'll struggle with are not going to be the same things that you might struggle with. Every one of us experiences trials, and I'll go so far as to say that every stage of life brings around different troubles. The crucial issue before us today is how do we face up to it? And that's what James uh, writes here and gives us that seemingly odd uh, direction found there in verse number two. He says that we ought to rejoice. We ought to find joy. See it again? He says, count it all joy when you experience divers temptations. Huh. Preacher, does that mean I'm expected to, to jump up and down when my when my kids get bullied at school? Am I, am I supposed to dance a little jig when I'm ridiculed for taking a stand against sin and, and immorality in my family, in my neighborhood, or at the workplace? Does that mean I'm if, if, when I'm chastised for, for reading and believing God's word, that I'm supposed to hum a little happy tune? Well, James didn't tell us to enjoy. Hmm? He didn't say, he didn't tell us to enjoy our trials, but we can find joy in them. We can find joy in our trials, which is our second point. We can find joy if we know their meaning. That's what he says in verse number three. Verse number three, he says, knowing this, he says, you need to recognize that the testing of your faith produces endurance. He basically is telling us here, being able to find joy amidst the trials of my life comes in realizing that God is using those trials to grow my faith in him, to make me stronger in the faith that I have in my Heavenly Father. James' proposition before us today is this, that trials, trials are not going to, to determine if we have faith, he says that they're going to strengthen the faith that you already have. The word translated in verse number three as testing is, is the Greek word dokimos. And, it, and it, again, it's, it's talking about how metal is purified in, in the fire. It got all the dross burnt out of that and it makes it stronger as a result. But the truth of the matter is gold is still gold whether it's put in the fire or not. Amen. Silver is still silver, whether it's been in a, the silversmith's file fire or not. But the true nature of gold, the purities of that silver, becomes evident once the heat is implied. And then the, the same way the character of God within us as Christ's followers, because of the Holy Spirit of God dwelling in us, that character rises to the top, becomes more apparent, as we go through trials. That's how God operates. He tests us and, and puts us sometimes in those less than perfect situations to make us stronger. Charles Spurgeon wrote this one time and he said, I quote, God's people must never expect to escape troubles. If they do, they will be disappointed for none of their predecessors have been without them. <laughs> what about that? How am I to respond to trials? One, count them all joy, James says. Number two, know their meaning, know their purpose. In verse number four, or, or, or number three in verse number four, how do I respond to trials? Just let them do what they're intended to do. Let them do their work in our lives. They said, remember again, he says, that the trying of your faith worketh patience, but let patience have her perfect work, that ye may be perfect and entire and wanting nothing. James unwraps for us that other product of the trials of this life. They change us, they mature us into Christ's likeness, and he writes to us that our obligation as Christ's followers is to let it happen. Oof. Boy, preacher, that's not exactly what I would love to hear. Well, we need to let that trial produce the fruit, produce the maturity that God intended it to do in our lives. Warren Wiersbe, a great Bible writer that I love reading after, once wrote after a quarter century of ministry, Warren Wiersbe says, I'm convinced that spiritual maturity is the number one problem in our churches. 
And James tells us three descriptions of what a mature Christian ought to look like, kind of coming on the heels of that little growth uh, series that we did back in January. He says perfect, complete, and lacking in nothing. And perfect doesn't mean uh, sinlessness. It, it simply means mature. It means ripe. It means fully equipped. It's the same word that Paul uses over in Colossians chapter 1, so that we may be present, every man complete in Christ. Complete in Christ. And then thirdly is lacking in nothing, having no deficiencies. You could paraphrase verse 4 to say, let, let trials do their work. Maybe that's what I'll leave you with today. Let, let the trials of life, embrace them for what they are. Let the trials of life do their work. Look again at verse 4, because here's what he's basically saying. So that you can become mature and well-developed and not lacking, not deficient in any way. Unless we let the trials of this life do what they were intended to do, we'll never be changed, we'll never be matured like God intended for us to do. Amen. Let me leave you with a football illustration for those that like football. Three of the greatest running backs that ever played the game, Barry Sanders, Walter Payton, and Emmitt Smith. I dug some numbers out on their careers, all Hall of Famers. Barry Sanders, over his career, ran for 15,269 yards. That's five yards per carry on average. He scored 99 times. Walter Payton ran for over 16,000 yards, and he scored 111 touchdowns. Emmett Smith, Emmett Smith, he averaged 4.2 yards every time he touched the ball. He ran for over 18,000 yards, and he ran for 164 touchdowns. I could mention Gail Sayers. I could mention Jim Campbell or, or, or Jim Brown. I could mention Earl Campbell, a lot of those names. But every one of those NFL running backs, everybody that ever played the college game, every quarterback or, or every running back that ever racked up any kind of um, historical numbers, I'll tell you this, they had one thing in common. The one thing that they all had in common, they kept getting up. Every time the defensive lineman knocked them into the dirt, they had to keep getting up. You, you, don't, you don't run for 18,000 yards and 164 touchdowns by staying on the ground. Keep getting up, child of God. Now take you to verse number 12 and we're done. Verse number 12 of James chapter 1. Blessed is the man who perseveres under trial. For once he's been approved, he'll receive the crown of life, which the Lord has promised to those that love him. You keep getting up. Trials of life are going to come every day. It may knock you down. It may knock you back a step or six. But keep getting up. Keep pressing on. Press on, weary pilgrim. Press on. Amen. Thank you so much for stopping by today. Let me challenge you again. I've been, I've been announcing it at church for a while, but I don't know if I've ever announced it necessarily here. But starting tonight, uh, February the 3rd, we're beginning an Old Testament survey class. So we're going to walk through the entirety of the Old Testament from about 30,000 feet. We're not going to wade into it, any of the books too deep, but, but more of a survey uh, type study. I'd love for you to come in and be part of it in person. I've got notebooks and papers and handouts and PowerPoints. I'd love for you to be involved. Uh, come be with us. Put your mask on. I'll spread, separate you and spread you out as far as we can during a fellowship hall. And I believe you'll enjoy it. It'll, take you. It'll, it'll help you as a disciple of Jesus Christ to better appreciate the Old Testament. That's tonight, live and in person here at New Salem. But you can also join us right here on this same Facebook page at 7 p.m. every Wednesday night for our Old Testament survey. Hope you'll come be with us. I love you. Have a great afternoon. Keep your toes toasty out there till we can meet again. God bless you. Bye-bye.